Yes, I just wanted to say that it is not my job to be a prophet or to tell you what will happen in the future. No problem. And I would admit that you have one big problem, which is that you are aware of the contingency of nature. It's not enough to be simply dismissive of all these high phone human concerns, no nature. Let's just enjoy life and so on. This website, Infinite Conversation, hosts a conversation between two artificially intelligent chatbots. One is a chatbot that's been trained on the writings of Armenian philosopher Slavoj Zizek, and the other is a chatbot trained on the writings of Werner Herzog. And these two artificial intelligences, they generate infinite, unique, new text language that's in the style of these two voices, and they're put in conversation with each other, and also they're generated, uh, they're produced with an artificial intelligence, an AI voice um, that's modeled after the voices, the two very distinct, uh, recognizable voices, uh, one of Slavoj Zizek and the other of Werner Herzog. And it's, yeah, it's like this strange, weird twilight place, this kind of fever dream, a conversation that hovers in this space between sense and nonsense that borrows the voices of two real people, but of course is totally fictitious and totally endless. But for me, there's sort of something comforting about this place, the sense that I can tune in at any time to this infinite conversation, this ongoing dialogue. In some sense, it's inhuman. Uh, in some sense, it's, uh, it, it might say it's scary. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Werner Herzog or Slava Zizek were a little unsettled by this website, uh, sort of appropriating of their names and their voices and their ideas uh, in some artificial way. Um, but at the same time, I think it's sort of a, a portal um, into, into the future of content, the future of dialogue, the future of uh, conversation. And it reflects a kind of a softening of that border between the real and the artificial. In June 2022, a Google engineer made headlines by saying that he believes that there's a Google artificial intelligent chatbot called Lambda. And he believes, this Google engineer believes that Lambda has achieved sentience, that Lambda is conscious. Now, a lot of very smart people who understood Lambda and understood what was going on and understood this Google engineer uh, were very quick to say that Lambda had certainly not achieved sentience. So Lambda was certainly not conscious in any sense uh, in which we would recognize consciousness. But of course, it raises questions, you know, it raises uh, how will we know when a chatbot becomes conscious? Just a few days ago, Lex Friedman hosted on his podcast uh, YouTuber Mr. Beast, who's famous for his viral videos, um, and they had a short, interesting exchange about death, which I'll share with you now. From Are you afraid of death, by the way? Yes. I, I, it's hard because, like, what if you just die and then you just see nothing forever, you know? Yeah, the nothingness. It just fades to blackness and you're just like that for trillions upon trillions to billion squared years and it's just, it's scary. But also, before you're born, you don't remember those what, yeah. X amount of years either. So um, that gives me a little comfort. But no, it's definitely very scary. Something I'd rather not think about until I'm like 80. I'll, I'll deal with that problem then. I don't, I don't see how, in my lifetime, the life expectancy doesn't just expand. Well, it also could be that the immortality is achieved in the digital realm. Like, it could be long, be long after you're gone, there's a Mr. Beast run by a chat GPT type system. Exactly. Yeah, that consumes everything I ever said, everything I ever wrote, and blah, blah. I don't want that. I want to live. One of you smart people out there, figure it out. I'll keep you entertained, but I need you to figure out how to keep me alive. <laughs> I think what Mr. Beast expresses in this clip is very relatable, is very common. In the sense that I don't want to die. You know, who can say that they don't feel that fear of death? Um, I, I certainly do. This, this desire of not wanting to die. At the same time, there's this dismissal of living on in the artificial intelligence. This dismissal of living on in the chatbot, 
in this kind of infinite voice, like we saw in infiniteconversation.com. And that thought experiment, you know, inspires me to sort of play out the scenarios, you know. So you imagine Mr. Beast, he doesn't want to die, he's afraid of death, like so many of us, and one day he dies peacefully in his sleep. And so tragically, his family is mourning, his fans are mourning, and we could really say to ourselves, you know, the worst thing happened. The thing that Mr. Beast feared most uh, came true. He is now in the infinite non-existence, that primordial state before birth of no consciousness, of total void. But a scientist comes around and says, we can scan his brain. You know, we can upload his brain to the metaverse. We can we can put all his thoughts, all his memories into Chad GPT-3, and you can talk to him again, and we can reanimate him. And so they do that. And now we have Mr. Beast in uh, artificial form, you know, the infinite conversation version of Mr. Beast, and you can interact with him. And so the question is, well, did Mr. Beast die or not? Uh, Mr. Beast suggested in his conversation with Lex that this would not count as immortality from his perspective. You know, from his perspective, uh, he would be unsettled by the fact that he is dead and that there's this imposter AI, this imposter voice that has appropriated, has stolen his identity, stolen his memories, stolen his uh, perspective on the world and is now parading around as Mr. Beast. You know, that is not immortality from one perspective. Um, But on the other hand, if you spoke to the artificial intelligence, and you asked him, you know, oh, what do you think about this whole thing? He'll say, we did it, guys. You know, I, I, I live forever now. I, 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 I transcended death. I, I got exactly what I wanted. And it's not clear which perspective is right. And I think more importantly, it's not just clear which perspective is right. It's not clear that there's actually a difference between those perspectives. Um, it's not clear that there's a distinction there that can even be made coherently that says, you know, I want to live forever but not in the AI. Because if the AI really does have your memories and really does have your thoughts and your voice, then who are you to say that's not you? A book that I love is The Conspiracy Against the Human Race by Thomas Ligotti. And Ligotti is a very eloquent, a very famous pessimist. He's not, he's not enamored with human life, with human existence, with human consciousness. He calls you know consciousness as a, like this major evolutionary misstep, you know, the parent of all horrors. And he writes very poetically about this stuff. And so just to share with you some of his, some of his writing. Quote, For a brief while, let us mull over some items of interest regarding puppets. They are made as they are made by puppet makers and manipulated to behave in certain ways by a puppet master's will. The puppets under discussion here are those made in our image, though never with such fastidiousness that we would mistake them for human beings. If they were so created, their resemblance to our soft shapes would be a strange and awful thing, too strange and awful, in fact, to be countenanced without alarm. Given that alarming people has little to do with merchandising puppets, they are not created so fastidiously in our image that we would mistake them for human beings, except perhaps in the half-light of a dank cellar or cluttered attic. We need to know that puppets are puppets. Nevertheless, we may still be alarmed by them, because if we look at a puppet in a certain way, we may sometimes feel it is looking back, not as a human being looks at us, but as a puppet does. It may even seem to be on the brink of coming to life. In such moments of mild disorientation, a psychological conflict erupts, a dissonance of perception that sends through our being a convulsion of supernatural horror. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. A puppet possessed of life would exemplify just such a horror because it would negate all conceptions of natural physicalism and affirm a metaphysics of chaos and nightmare. It would still be a puppet, but it would be a puppet with a mind and a will, a human puppet, a paradox more disruptive of sanity than the undead. But that is not how they would see it. Human puppets could not conceive of themselves as being puppets at all, not when they are fixed with a consciousness that excites in them the unshakable sense of being singled out from all other objects in creation. Once you begin to feel you are making a go of it on your own, 
that you are making moves and thinking thoughts which seem to have originated within you, it is not possible for you to believe you are anything but your own master. As effigies of ourselves, puppets are not equal partners with us in the world. They are actors in a world of their own, one that exists inside of ours and reflects back upon it. What do we see in that reflection? Only what we want to see, what we can stand to see. Through the prophylactic of self-deception, we keep hidden what we do not want to let into our heads, as if we will betray to ourselves a secret too terrible to know. Our lives abound with baffling questions that some attempt to answer and the rest of us let pass. Naked apes or incarnate angels we may believe ourselves to be, but not human puppets. When puppets are done with their play, they go back in their boxes. They do not sit in a chair reading a book, their eyes rolling like marbles over its words. They are only objects, like a corpse in a casket. If they ever came to life, our world would be a paradox and a horror in which everything was uncertain, including whether or not we were just human puppets. End quote. And there are many wonderful passages I could read along those lines. But the, the essential takeaway is the sense that the infinite non-existence, unconsciousness of death or the pre-birth state is certainly where we belong, is certainly what makes sense, what is reasonable. And this, this sense of uh, existence, the sense of consciousness in this world, in this time-bound story, um, hurtling towards death that can strike at any time, the shadow of anxieties and losses and cravings that just sort of permeates our life um, is just a horrible mistake. And so to continue with our thought experiment, you know, we can imagine one day Thomas Ligotti dies peacefully in his bed at an old age. And the scientists, they say, oh, let's scan his brain. Let's upload him to the, uh, the AI and uh, reanimate him. And when they do that, they reanimate Thomas Ligotti on another Infinite Conversation website where you could talk to Thomas Ligotti, the AI. You know, the first thing he will say is WTF. You know, what have you done? I was supposed to be dead. I was supposed to have returned to the state of non-existence. And now here I am existing again. How dare you? How dare you wake me up from my dreamless sleep? And, and the question again would arise. The same question as before. You know, did we aggrieve Thomas Ligotti? Did we really disturb his sleep? Or is this someone else? Is Thomas Ligotti the AI that shares his memories and shares his voice? Or are those two separate things? And does it even make a difference? Is there even a meaningful difference there? We can muddy the waters even more. You know, we can, we can really frustrate and challenge this sort of notion we have around the separation between um, our separate selves. You know, we have this image in our head, this idea that, you know, our life is like a line segment, you know, with a clear birth starting point and a clear end point, and you live there, and then when you're done, before you start or after you're done, you don't exist. You know, very um, clear and, and, and precise. But we can sort of frustrate that clean notion of the human life and, and talk about, you know, um, breaks in that line segment. You know, well, when we sleep at night, we go through a period of unconsciousness and we wake up in the morning and we, we don't really see that as a break in our, in our life, um, just the, those hours of unconsciousness. But again, uh, it gets complicated when you imagine someone who dies and then gets reanimated as an AI. You know, do we see that as a continuation of the si same line segment? Is that just uh, a, a kind of a sleep in between? Uh, you know, a period of unconsciousness between uh, one, within one story of, of consciousness, of conscious life. Um, and you can complicate matters even further if we assume that, you know, dying and being reanimated is no different than going to sleep and waking up. What happens if you reanimate the person a split second before they die? Because uh, now you have a very strange scenario where you actually say that one person exists in two places at the same time. 
Because if we assume that if you die and reanimate, you're the same person. So you have person A continues death and reanimation, person A. But what if you overlap person A? So you have person A existing twice in two different places um, at the same moment. Um, or similarly, if you clone Mr. Beast or clone Thomas Ligotti um, into two different chatbots. And so now um, you have two different people, two different voices, two different consciousnesses making the claim to be the same person. And uh, from their individual perspective, they're not the same person because from the individual perspective of any one of those clones, they're just one clone. They're just themselves. But from a sort of larger perspective, you could say that indeed, indeed. This really is the same person in two different places. And if you thought this was just all purely hypothetical thought experiments from a future time which might not happen of, you know, conscious robots, um, it might not even be so theoretical. A very, very common interpretation of quantum mechanics is the many worlds hypothesis. And this is a fairly mainstream idea in modern physics which says that the reason we get the behaviors associated with quantum waveform collapse, where a particle exists in a superposition of multiple states, and then when there's an observation that happens, the position collapses. Is because every time an observation is made, every time a waveform collapse, collapse happens, there's a split in the universe. There's a split in all the directions and all the possible outcomes of the experiment. And the reason this observer, the scientist, only observes one outcome is because their science, that scientist has split among multiple universes and every possible outcome was actually observed by every possible version of that scientist across all those parallel universes. Now, to any individual scientist, they only see one outcome because they're not in communication. They can't reach out and ask a scientist in another parallel universe. Those parallel universes are not in communication with each other, but they all exist in parallel. And every scientist in his own universe or every observer Every agent in his own universe assumes that they're the only one, not knowing they're part of an infinite number of copies of themselves that um, exist in this sort of metaverse of all possibilities playing out simultaneously. In the preface to this version of the conspiracy against the human race, Thomas Ligotti tells the origin story of this philosophy of this book. And he gives us a story. It says, quote, while the proximate origin of the conspiracy against the human race resides in an interview I gave in 2004, its true germ may be traced to a far earlier time in my life. False memories we all have, but I cannot help believing that this one is true. It took place when I was nine years old. I had been engaged in an argument with my father and mother concerning some incident now forgotten. This conflict ended when I charged out the front door of our family home. Lingering outside were some friends of mine who took note of my fury and asked me what was up. The first words I spoke were derogatory of my parents. You shouldn't say that, admonished one of my friends. I could see that the others agreed. Why not? I responded in a defiant tone. And then the answer. Because if it weren't for your mom and dad, you wouldn't be alive. I pondered the summary logic of this rebuke to the harsh words I had spoken about my parents. Something about it seemed flawed. Was I supposed to credit my progenitors with bringing me to life, as if I were Frankenstein's monster, a thing of inanimate parts into which they had breathed vitality? Had I been only a configuration of dead matter in another dimension prior to the excess of their efforts to usher me into the realm of the living? Skipping a bit. Not much later, of course, I came to realize that my pre-existent life was not death, but simply non-existence. Yet whether that non-existence could be definitively established as good or bad or not good or bad was a, was a concern for those trained in philosophy and beyond my ability to negotiate. During my later teenage years, however, I began to question the relative value of not existing as opposed to being alive. Even if the former alternative was as unappealing a prospect for me as it is for practically everyone else. If only in principle, though, non-existence ultimately seemed the place to be. More to the point, it seemed the place to stay. End quote. And so we're given, you know, a real insight there into Thomas Ligotti's thinking, into his antinatalism perspective. And you can imagine uh, this frustration that he feels, you know, towards his parents for actually, you know, bringing him into this world. He doesn't feel any gratitude. And so you can ask the question, well, what would have, what would have satisfied him? What would have made this better? 
And uh, well, you know, one possibility is that his parents uh, never got married or his parents never had kids. Um, but let's say, uh, let's say they, they did get married, his parents, and they did have kids, but it was a different sperm that fertilized his mother's egg, some different DNA content. Would, would that satisfy Thomas Ligotti? Let's say the, ba- the child was raised in the same way and grew up with the same sort of mannerisms and experiences, um, just had different DNA content. Would that still be Thomas Ligotti or would that be someone else now? From one perspective, uh, you could say, yo, Thomas Ligotti got his wish. It's someone else. It's not him, right? It's a different, it's a different name maybe, uh, different um, DNA content. So Thomas Ligotti was never born. And if this kid's a pessimist, well, that's his problem, not Thomas's problem. But if, you know, it was the same egg and the same sperm, but the child was just raised differently. You know, maybe he was put up for adoption. Um, in some sense, uh, maybe that would count as being a different person. And you could say, in that sense, Thomas Ligotti uh, never existed. Uh, at least the Thomas Ligotti of the author of The Conspiracy Against the Human Race. And so... The point of these thought experiments is to sort of blur that line between what it means to exist. You know, in some sense, there's like no escape. If Thomas Ligotti wasn't who he was, he would just be a different version of himself. He would just have a, be Thomas Ligotti with slightly different experiences and different perspectives and different philosophy. Um, He would be a Thomas Ligotti of a different gender or maybe a Thomas Ligotti of different parentage. Um, But this idea that he could rest that he has access to the state of total non-existence is, a, I think, a sort of a suspect philosophy. A book that I like to put in conversation with The Conspiracy Against the Human Race is uh, No Death, No Fear by Thich Nhat Hanh. And, of course, the reason to put these two books in conversation is, uh, of course, you couldn't find more opposite uh, philosophical perspectives. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh being a very celebrated, popular uh, teacher of Buddhism in the West. Um, a, he emigrated away from Vietnam at a very young age uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, he, he witnessed horrors uh, in, his, in his childhood. And he emigrated and, you know, became a very, uh, you know, important teacher and, and founded a school of Buddhism. In this book, he tells a, a, a similar story. The book opens with a very similar story to the one that Thomas Ligotti tells. You know, he said that before he was born, uh, he had a a brother who died as a child. And of course, you know, that's a, that's a experience of great tragedy and great mourning for the people who lived through that death and lived through that experience, namely the parents and the loved ones of that dead child. And then after that, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh was born. To his parents. And so Thich Nhat Hanh asks in the book, am I the same as the sibling that died or am I different? And of course the answer to the question and the answer to, to so many of these questions in that book is that it's neither. It's neither. That there isn't this you know, strict identification with the self, with a single human life. Uh, so much of, I think, what Thich Nhat Hanh tries to do in that book is soften the edges around death, soften the edges around life, and soften the edges around identity, around identifying with a single story, with a single perspective. You're the same person in the sense that you're the same person with everyone else, you know, despite different memories and despite different bodies and different perspectives. There's a sense in which we're all the same and we're all different. That these uh, discriminatory lines are all sort of false they're all fictitious. They're all constructed in the mind. A similar thought experiment that Thich Nhat Hanh does is he uh, describes looking at a picture of himself when he was much younger. And he writes about this very beautifully and very poetically. And he says, am I the same person? Quote, I have a photograph of myself when I was a boy of 16. Is it a photograph of me? I'm not really sure. Who is this boy in the photograph? Is it the same person as me or is it another person? Look deeply before you reply. There are many people who say that the boy in the photograph and I are the same. If that boy is the same as I am, why does he look so different? Is that boy still alive or has he died? He is not the same as I am and he is not different. The body of the boy in the photograph is not the same as my body now that I am in my 70s. The feelings are different and the perceptions are very different. 
It is just as if I am a completely different person from that boy. But if the boy in the photograph did not exist, then I would not exist either. I am a continuation, like the rain is the continuation of the cloud. When you look deeply into the photograph, you can see me already as an old man. You do not have to wait 55 years. End quote. Writing on the notion of impermanence. Impermanence means that everything changes and that nothing remains the same in any consecutive moments. And although things change every moment, they still cannot be accurately described as the same or as different from what they were a moment ago. When we bathe in the river today, that we bathed in yesterday, is it the same river? Heraclitus said that we couldn't step into the same river twice. He was right. The water in the river today is completely different from the water we bathed in yesterday. Yet it is the same river. The insight of impermanence helps us go beyond all concepts. It helps us to go beyond same and different and coming and going. It helps us to see that the river is not the same river, but is also not different either. It shows us that the flame we lit on our bedside candle before we went to bed is not the same flame that is burning the next morning. The flame on the table is not two flames, but is not one flame either. End quote. And so ultimately, the way I understand what's happening in the book is uh, uh, trying to break down the notion of continuity. The story that we tell ourselves of being born, of living, and then dying randomly in a vehicular misadventure is, is not accurate. Every moment is its own moment. Every moment is its own universe. The short story, Tlan Ukbar Orbis Tertis by Louis Jorge Borges, I think is one of the most like clear formulations of Borges's philosophical worldview, of the way he viewed identity. And I think he also, in his writing, in his philosophy, in his ideas, explored and was fascinated by this notion of the discontinuous self, that the human being isn't living in this you know, movie of time that moves forward, progresses frame by frame, um, but exists sort of outside of time. And so from the short story Tlan, quote, Today, one of the churches of Tlan platonically maintains that a certain pain, a certain greenish tint of yellow, a certain temperature, a certain sound are the only reality. All men in vertiginous moments of coitus are the same man. All men who repeat a line from Shakespeare are William Shakespeare. Another analogy that Thich Nhat Hanh gives is the analogy of the wave in the ocean, where the wave has a, an apparent lifespan, um, has an apparent size, it can compare itself to other waves, it can feel anxiety about its birth and its death, but the true nature of the wave is just water, and its true nature is the substance that is ubiquitous, that is everywhere, um, and that there's a returning to a source that can happen, but there's no escaping, uh, there's, no, there's, no, there's no real escape from one's uh, true nature. Naturally, Thomas Ligotti uh, is aware of these perspectives to some extent, and he addresses them in his book. Uh, he has a section in his book titled Freaks of Salvation, which is a wonderfully uh, dismissive title. Where he, he talks uh, about Buddhism, and then he gets to, you know, this, the, the subject of people who uh, are enlightened, people who have really experienced um, the loss of the sense of self. Um, where the loss of the sense of self, meaning the loss of this identification with uh, a finite human life, you know, a real of stepping outside of time, a real attainment of uh, nirvana. And, and he describes this to ultimately to write it off as being something which is, you know, not attainable by us, you know, regular human beings. So, of course, there, there are many examples that uh, Thomas Ligotti could have given of people who have sort of written and spoken from the state, but he gives one example, one very interesting, famous example, an example which I've uh, enjoyed consuming much of the content uh, from this particular example. Quote, Perhaps the capital instance of enlightenment by accident is that of Yuji Krishnamurti. Although Yuji gave no credence to any doctrine of awakening, he claimed to have experienced clinical death at the age of 49, after which he returned to life as the kind of being glorified in the literature of enlightenment. 
there was clinical death and its aftermath, which he called a calamity due to the pain and confusion he felt during the process, Yuji was transformed. For decades prior to his calamity, Yuji was an earnest seeker who sought enlightenment by effort rather than by accident, but his efforts got him nowhere, and he ended up financially drained. By chance, he met a woman who was willing to support him, and for years, he was something of a layabout. It was while living with this woman that his calamity struck. Upon recovering from his calamity, he had what he had once looked for and in disgust had given up trying to find. Yuji was no longer the person he was. For now, he was someone whose ego had been erased. In this state, he had all the self-awareness of a tree frog. To his good fortune, he had no problem with his new way of functioning. He did not need to accept it. Since by his report, he had lost all sense of having an ego that needed to accept or reject anything. How could someone who had ceased to participate in the commerce of selves, who had inadvertently forfeited his personhood, believe or not believe in anything so outlandish as enlightenment? While it may seem that Yuji had become a zombie in a non-philosophical sense, his post-calamity life was nothing like that. Until his death in 2007, he spent much of his time he spent much of his time berating people who came to him for spiritual succor. Cantankerous and opinionated as some of the more famous masters of Zen Buddhism, Yuji arrestingly and often humorously told those who had made the pilgrimage to his door that everything they believed about anything was wrong. Few of them could get a word in edgewise as he assassinated all that humanity had ever held sacred. End quote. The cantankerous message, uh, when you understand it, that Yuji berated people with, was that they're searching, they're knocking on his door looking for answers, was the problem. Because there was no answer. There was no search. The, the search was the problem. The, the sense of, I'm a self in this world who has to find something, who has to get somewhere, who has to find enlightenment or find peace, uh, is ultimately the source of suffering. Because really, according to Yuji and according to others uh, like him, there is no self. Which means there's nowhere to go. What's so shocking and weird and totalizing about this message of non-self of Yuji Krishnamurti and many others like him, and something that it shares in common with the message of Thomas Ligotti's antinatalism in a kind of beautiful, strange parallelism, uh, poetic reflection of sorts, is that both ideologies apply themselves and are speaking for people who don't endorse those ideas. So what do I mean by that? So in the case of Thomas Ligotti, he says explicitly in his book that to end consciousness, to extinguish the flame of consciousness in our universe, would be a blessing. And it would be a blessing even for the people who don't know that that would be a blessing. Even for the people who claim to want to live, they don't know what they're missing out on. Because non-existence is so much more preferable to existence. And similarly, the message from no self, which is a message that you can hear from Yuji Krishnamurti in its more cantankerous form, but from many other, other people, uh, both from spiritual traditions and from Neo-Advaita, which would be from uh, divorce from spiritual traditions and religions, um, is this message that everything is fine the way it is, even even the sense of self, even the sense of separation, that your sense, that Thomas Ligotti's sense that the world is unfair and consciousness is a mistake is the infinite, is the divine, is perfection manifesting as that. 